Well, hey, good afternoon, everyone. I am here talking with my dear friend, Jackson Crum, former lead pastor in Chicago. Jackson, how are you? I'm well. Tommy, it's so good to see you. Well, I hope a lot of times is we're talking, uh, Jackson now lives in the Euro Asia, Euro Asia area now in his life. And so how is it living away from Chicago? What is it, the one thing that you miss it? You know what I miss, Tommy? I, I miss sports. <laughs> I'm able to watch the NFL the next day, you know, because of uh, uh, me and a bunch of guys who got in the NFL package and we share it. But I miss sports. I miss college football, you know, all the deep things of life, right? And, and, of, and of course, I miss people. You know, there's a, we yeah. had a lot of good friendships and relationships, and I miss people. Yeah. Like, well, oh, hey, I, <laughs> thank you very much, especially the Eagles, right? Eagle, you know, Eagles and Bears are my two teams, and so both of them are terrible this year. You know, which is frustrating, which is no fun to watch. But I'm also a Northwestern fan, and they're playing well. And I'm the yeah. Penn State fan, and they're absolutely terrible. So I got one out of four. Well, Jackson, hey, thanks for finding some time to talk. Is especially in this day of COVID, a lot of times I want to bring you on because of your experience leading a a large Blanco church in Chicago for so many years to give some tips on end of year fundraising, especially during this time of COVID-19, where a lot of pastors have not really had to deal with it. So I'm going to turn it over to you here, Jackson. All right, Tommy. Thank you again. It's, I love you. you. You are a dear friend, and I love being able to serve with you like this. Folks, let me, let me share a couple, two key things that have shaped my thinking around money and giving in the church. Uh, and, and Donna, Pop, can you shut these doors, Donna, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> We're like everybody else at home and noise travels. Uh, first, everything must have a gospel motivation or it will become moralistic. If we don't think about money around the gospel and what the gospel looks like, what's going to happen is we'll just begin to think about people ought to do this, they ought to do that. Instead of that, there is a motivation, there's a strong motivation in what it means to be a giver. And frankly, the generosity of God is a gospel issue. The giving of his son to the undeserved, he gave his best in giving his son. Jesus came and gave himself sacrificially in giving to those who would never give back. I mean, we could never repay what Jesus has done for us. And in his giving, he doesn't keep score. So that's one. I think it's important that we see this whole idea around giving and money through a gospel lens. The second one is stewardship really is a discipleship issue, not a financial issue. Yeah, you got to pay your bills, no doubt about it. You got to fund the ministries, I totally understand. But you have to see the bigger picture of helping your folks understand the issue of obedience and stewardship. Uh, we teach on this, or we taught on this and for a number of years, and, and, and it's interesting. Many times people caught it once they moved. The average stay at our church was three to five years in the city, and they would move elsewhere for whatever reasons. And then I would get an email later saying, you know, all that stuff you talked about, stewardship and all that, I'm beginning now to give to the church that I'm attending. And so I go, that's fantastic. I'm, I am glad that you are. You know, I wish they would have started when they were with us, but I'm glad they caught it. See, what we're doing is we're helping people develop a biblical worldview. And the, and the worldview is this. They need to see themselves as stewards and not givers. That they need to see themselves as investors of what they are stewarding. And they're stewarding on the behalf of someone else who's entrusted these things to their care and that they're going to be held accountable to the owner for how they use his resources. If people don't give, they steward, they invest. God is giving everything that we have. We don't own anything. We're a steward of all these things entrusted to our care, not just our finances, finances, but our possessions, our education, our time. Hospitality is a stewardship issue. My home, my car is a stewardship issue. And, and for years, I struggled with lending my car out. I never drove a brand new car, and I would still have trouble lending out my car. And so one of the ways I learned to steward is that every time I left town, I lent my car to someone, and it began to help me break that area of holding it with you know, my fist closed, learning that I'm a steward. It's not my car. 
It's been lent to me and I'm to steward it well. And so ways that I think that we need to look around at this in, in, in COVID season, but at any season, but especially it's COVID, is we need to take time with our offering, for instance. Don't make this a wasted moment between, between singing and preaching. We must see that giving is worship, singing, serving, teaching, all is worship. Giving is worship. And we need, need to use the offering for short educational opportunities. Uh, we need to tell stories. We need to tell stories of people giving, of what they're giving to ministries in the church and outside the church and what's taking place. See, people want to be part of a winning team and, and to say it crassly, I, I realize. And so how is our church winning in the work of the kingdom? And we need to tell stories of what God is doing, how what we are giving and investing, stewarding financially, how is it having an impact? We need to thank people. And I think sometimes we forget that. We need to thank people for giving, for investing in the kingdom. It's such a simple thing, but just saying thank you guys for your sacrifices and your choices to invest in the kingdom. We need to remind people that we're trusting our elders to make wise stewardship decisions on where this money needs to go. The idea is that money in your budget you know, it's we get, we have this money in our budget that we want to give for the sake of other people and for the sake of the kingdom work. Here's just an idea. One of the things we started working on at Park toward the end was setting money aside in our budget and asking our people, where should we give it? You know, inviting input. Is it a ministry in the church or is it ministry outside the church? But helping to increase some level of ownership. And we can't be afraid to let people know how the church is doing. You know, people want to know what we're doing, how we're doing. I don't know how many times that I have been told over the years, why didn't you just tell us that the church was in a tough season? And I thought I was. Frankly, we have to over communicate about it because just about the time I get sick of saying it is just about the time people really begin to get it. And so we need to let people know we're in a tough season. Our giving is down for whatever reasons, that, but we need to share it and find fun ways to do it. One time I got up with a mustard bottle and a ketchup bottle, and I put them on the podium. I put them on the music stand. We don't use a podium, but on the music stand. And people looked at it. I said, I want to talk about two things to get together uh, this morning. Uh, one is that we need to catch up. We're behind, and we need to catch up. And I said, the second thing is we need to muster the troops in order for us to catch up. And people laughed and people thought it was goofy. But you know what's interesting? People have remembered it years later. They've come back and said, man, I remember the mustard and ketchup. And so we need to find ways to remind people what's going on. And I would tell you, don't wait till December to communicate to the people you're behind. That is one of the first things that I, that I did when I went to park is I moved our fiscal year to September 1. So we didn't lend ourselves along with all the other ministries to putting on the full court pressure on people in December. So we started that much earlier. But if it is in December, if your, if your new year begins January 1 with the calendar new year, start your communication much earlier, letting people know where you are and explaining the why you are where you are. People want to know. They're not dumb. Bring them up to date. But realize that when you start in December, you are, you are in the midst of much messaging from other organizations that are communicating about that their needs as well. I would also say to us, we need to help people see that their giving is tied to the mission of the church. Now, let me just take a moment here. I used to believe... We need to be strong in casting vision. And I still believe that. I still believe that. But things have changed. It's no longer casting vision. It's communicating the cause. Builders, boomers, and some busters would give out a responsibility or they'd give out of a, someone casting great vision and all the gimmicks that go with it. But vision does not motivate millennials. Cause motivates millennials. They kind of yawn when you cast vision, but if you can explain it in terms of a cause, cause meaning how will the resources be used to address the issues that are affecting people? 
How will it help people in the city or around the world? When you think of the needs of people and then what you're doing is going to address those needs, that's what they get excited about. And frankly, they've made the church better that way. They, they pushed us to have to think better. We've got to answer the question for people, why should I give? It's not enough just to say you need to be obedient. Of course, that's true. They need to be obedient. But frankly, we need to help people understand why should they invest? Why should they steward? And I'm telling you, parachurch organizations do this so much better than the church, explaining the cause and the need of the cause, homelessness, fatherlessness, educational issues. And so one of the things we need to do then is to preach around it. We need to preach our values. We need to preach our cause. We need to preach our needs. We need to be afraid, not be afraid, I should say, to, to preach on giving, preach on stewardship, preach on investing. We believe the Bible is authoritative for those of us that are followers of Christ and we live under its authority as God's word to us. We need to believe in its power and its power to convict and educate and encourage. So we need to preach on giving. We need to talk about it. And as a church at Park, we would talk about it at least once or twice a year for sure. But then I would choose to use illustrations in my messages throughout the year on generosity, find ways to communicate and paint pictures for people. Now, will you get feedback? You will. I'm telling you, you're going to get feedback from people who will say, all you ever do is talk about giving. And then I remind people, Jesus spoke about money more than he talked about the kingdom of heaven. And then I asked them, could you remind me the last time other than last Sunday when I talked about money? It's just a place where people are very tense. They're very protective when it comes to, to money issues. Someone once said that the wallet's the last thing that enters into the kingdom. Money really is an idol and it's a stronghold for many people. And so they're sensitive to it, but we have to address it. We need to come up with something that fits our vision, our cause, that draws people and helps them to get a bigger picture of what God is doing. Some of the things we did at Park is we talked about regularly, 1% of the city. We talked about we wanted to see 1% of the city become followers of Christ and get in, involved and incorporated in the biblical community. You know, just 1%. That's what we were praying for Park. And then our prayer would be that other churches would take on 1% of the city and that we would see the city of Chicago change. And that really caught with people. We talked about we want to see a, a biblical church in every micro neighborhood in the city of Chicago. And depending on what you read, there's 221 micro neighborhoods in Chicago. We want to see a gospel preaching church in every one, not from Park, but from someone, a gospel preaching church. So I think we need to explain something that is big, that is going to cause people to say, unless God's in it, we're doomed now, why do we want to see a gospel preaching church in every part of the city? Because of the needs of the city, that if the gospel there, it can address broken marriages, it can address sexual addiction and drugs and a number of other things, that the gospel brings hope and healing. And so we need to communicate this and we need to invite people to be a part of something so much bigger than what they currently are thinking of when they're thinking about the church and when they're thinking about themselves. We need to celebrate then what God is doing. We need to tell stories. A church in every micro neighborhood, one of the things we began to do is we began to pray for other churches around the city. We'd show the picture of the pastor and where the church is, and then we would, by name, pray for that pastor and pray for that church regularly. One time we were doing that on a Sunday, and I was praying for this pastor, and it happened to be during the summer when he was on vacation. He's sitting in the very back of the church, and he calls out, Jackson, I'm here. Had no idea that he was going to be in the service that week. But he heard us pray for him by name. And that helped people get a much bigger picture than just Park, that we were engaged in something much bigger as we are engaged with other churches and wanting to get behind the work of other churches. People need to be taught that their first fruits should go to the church they're a part of. That doesn't mean they cannot or should not give other places. They should, but only after first giving to their local faith community where they're being fed and cared for. We are called to sacrifice even for those we have never met. And that's the very essence of the gospel. We give for the sake of others. And the church is God's main instrument 
of the gospel going out and engaging. There's other ways and other things that he also uses, but the church is what he's called. When you read through the book of Acts, it's the church. Something else we need to remind ourselves of and remind our people of, it's not an equal gift, but an equal sacrifice. People can't all give the same financial amount or give the same amount of time or whatever, but we can all have an equal sacrifice. We have to steward what's been entrusted to our care. $100 from one guy will be a huge sacrifice where $10,000 from another guy may not be at all. But what does it mean for us? It's not an equal gift, but it's an equal sacrifice. And folks, I would say to you, it's important as leaders that you model for your people what stewardship looks like. Leaders need to model for their people what choices you're making. What are you doing? What are you as a family going to do? What choices are you going to make? You need to share not so much the amount, but you need to share that you're in process with this as well. I would regularly share the questions and in, in conversations that Don and I are having. I shared one time that Don and I every year choose to increase our giving by a half a percent. They needed to know I'm in this with them and I'm making the same choices. And if we're talking about a ministry in the city, I'd let our folks know that Don and I love this ministry and we too are giving above and beyond what we give to our church to this ministry because we want to see this ministry flourish. A very key thing in finances in the church, especially now, is we need to do a great job of managing the financial resources of the church. People want to know you're managing the church's finances well. Nothing will spook people faster than the perception of a poorly run finance department. One of the things we did is we got involved with an organization that, a Christian organization that was engaged with churches and parachurch ministries kind of gave us a, a stamp of approval. Uh, we had to get audited every year. We had to open up our books. There's a number of things that we needed to do, but our people knew then that there was another organization that looked into things to make sure we were doing everything above board. That was an incredibly important value for me, and it's something I introduced in the first year or two of becoming the pastor at Park. We need to have training on how to manage money. Our folks need to know how to manage money. Financial Peace University, for instance, is a great program because a big problem with millennials, the average age at Park when I was there was 31 years old. So we had a ton of millennials. Millennials can't invest in the kingdom because they're in such debt. And so we need to help them get out of debt. They might want to give. They might want to live generously. They want to steward, but they're not able to. So how do we help them manage that? Give them classes on how to do it. And I would say, too, in, in part of this is we need to preach to the issues of greed and I want but I don't need mentality that is just rampant in America. I need to have the newest and the latest and the best. We need to remind people that in the New Testament, it's talked generosity is what's talked about, not tithing in the Old Testament. Most of us know is 22 or 23 percent was the tithe, but you can't find that in the New Testament. Ten percent should be the starting point, not the ending point. Too many people do 10 percent. They think they're done. Instead, they should push themselves to keep learning how to live more and more generously. They should figure out what they can live on. And then listen to this. They need to choose to live below it, choose to live below it. Live below what they think they need, not what they want. And then each raise is an easy opportunity to increase their ability to give generously, not always to increase their standard of living, which most of us think of. I get a raise, I'm able to buy a little bit more. But if we learn to live on less, we're able to give more away. We need to stretch their generosity, just like we need to be stretched as leaders to encourage them to increase a half percent or for some people, 1% a year. Maybe they can't start at 10%. They truly can, and they can only start at 3 or 4%. Then how do they make a choice to increase every year? One of our elders, the, the lead elder for our team, when I first came for the first many years, he would raise the church's budget every year. And I said to him, man, I feel responsible for that. He goes, no, we're all responsible for that. It's not just you. 
we're all responsible, but we need to encourage our people to learn to grow in their generosity. Man, I've never had an elder say that to me before. One of the things that we do practically is that I would thank first time investors in the church. I'd email them or I'd call them and I would say, I don't know what you gave. I've only been told that you've started giving and I just wanna thank you for investing in the work of the kingdom here at Park. Just a very small way. And most of the time they would say to me, man, no one's ever said that to me. And speaking of that, I don't wanna know what anyone gives at the church. There was a time I was in a church plant and our uh, administrator said, I think it's important that you know what people give. And so for a couple of months, I looked at every giving statement and it messed me up for the simple reason that sometimes the people that were the hardest to deal with and were the most demanding gave little or nothing at all to the church. Or I find my, found myself beginning to kind of shift the way I looked at people who gave a lot at the church. And I realized I can't lead this way. So I don't know what anybody gives and I don't want to know what anybody gives. I need to treat all people equally. I want to also encourage you too. that one of the ways you can help your people grow is to find special times for people to invest above and beyond their normal giving. Find ways to stretch them. At Park, we did a, a invest one day of your salary toward the needs of the city. Just one day. Figure out what one day of work looks like for you and be willing to invest that into what we call Renew Chicago for the sake of the needs of the city. And then what happens is people that have not given before find the challenge, they step in and many times they begin to give on a regular basis after that. I think it's important too to help people understand where they can make sacrifices, like give up one Starbucks a week. You know, they go in and get that fancy Starbucks, several bucks, just give up one a week. Eat out one less time a week. Take your lunch to work. Do a local vacation instead of flying halfway around the world, at least at one time. Keep your iPhone one more year, at least six more months. You know, give people practical ways that they can sacrifice, because many of them are thinking of it this way. But offer it to them. You know, share it as a way of, of, uh, of an example. But remember to explain the why. What's the cause? What is this going to be used for? Just so they understand, it's not that the church gets wealthier, but it's that we're able to invest more in what's taking place. Uh, one potential pitfall to be mindful of, and then I'm going to stop and we'll take some questions. Some people think that because they give, they now have a vote in how things are done. Uh, the more they give, the more they think they should have influence. I can't begin to tell you how many times people came to my office over the years of being a pastor uh, and frankly, they wanted to complain about something and they would start off by going, we give to this church. You know, like that all of a sudden gave them carte blanche to be able to say or to influence her to do whatever they need to do. And I would respond, I would meet with you whether you gave anything at all. Because I believe as leaders, we should be listening to people. Of course, we need to listen to people, but we also need to help people understand that this isn't a club and that they played their they paid their dues, therefore they have a vote. You know, that, that, that we as followers of Christ, of course, care about our church and should speak into issues and talk to our elders, but not because we give, but because we are followers of Christ engaged in the working king. One of the hardest conversations I ever had was in a church plant where a guy was involved with us who gave a large chunk of our church planning budget. And we had a couple of staff and, and like a church plant, you know, it was week to week, month to month. And God was doing some very exciting things. But this one guy who gave a significant amount it just had such strong opinions. He's frankly a pain in the rump. I'll never forget. I met him for lunch and I had to look at him and say to him, if you can't give joyfully and if you can't give with open hands, then you need to stop it. And I'm telling you what my heart was about to beat out of my chest. He didn't answer me then. I walked all the way back to the office going, oh, my goodness gracious, have I just sunk this thing? You know, thinking so humanly about this. Oh, goodness, what's going to happen? He's going to quit giving. He's mad and upset. Instead of, <clears throat> pardon me, instead of thinking, hey, 
I needed to speak into his life, whether he gave a dollar or whether he gave this large amount, because this is a discipleship issue with him. Again, now with all that being said, leaders also need to listen and we need to be responsive regardless how much people give. Let me pause there and let me turn this back over to Tommy and to see if there's any questions. Yep. Hey, thank you very much, Jackson. Are you able to hear me well, Jackson? Yep. Hey, let me ask you a quick question is, I think a lot of times is we're doing this on behalf of a seminary as well too. And for some of those, we've been to seminary, we've gotten our master's, everything like that, is when you left, what didn't they teach you? What are some of the things that you had to learn along the way in your early years? They didn't teach me about leadership. They didn't teach me about church administration, Tommy. Yeah. You know, they didn't talk at all about how to read a budget. You know, I had to sit in meetings and have the guy next to me, a business guy, explain to me how to read a read a budget. And then leadership. You know, I had to figure out leadership. And some guys have that already. It's a spiritual gift that God has entrusted to some, but others have to figure it out and learn. We all need to sharpen it regardless. But I would say administrative administration and leadership is not something. Man, I could read the passage. I took Greek. I took Hebrew. You know, you you know, you've been there. I, all those things. But really, the practical part of leading a church was left off. At Got least it. where I went. Yeah. And in the area of fundraising, is how how did you do fundraising or now compared to do it when you first started? What were some of the things that you learned along the way over the years? But one was to cast vision or now to cast, you know, to explain the cause. Uh, I just thought Christians, <laughs> Christians gave because they knew they were supposed to. You know, I mean, we're supposed to. Now, I forgot my own story. I didn't give. You know, I learned to give. Frankly, I learned how to give through my wife. My wife, as a young follower of Christ, learned generosity. And I'll never forget, she said to me when we were engaged one day, I can tell you right where we were in Chicago. And she said it to me, she said, I give, now we give. And it's like, well, I want to be married to her. Okay, I'll give. But I didn't know how to give. I learned how to give. And I didn't think about the people sitting in our seats needed to learn how to give. That's something that had to develop and grow over time. During this time of COVID-19, there are some people who are struggling with their work, struggling in terms of where their income, they've been laid off. But there are some people who have done really, really well. Talk about how do you address both groups, individually or as a group? I think you say to the ones that are struggling, listen, here's the time for the church to help you. This is when benevolence needs to kick in. Let us come along your side. And benevolence doesn't always mean finances. It can mean a number of other things. But let us come along your side. Now, if if, if you are able to give, that's between you and the Lord, and, and you, you make adjustments based on what you're able to do. I still believe it's important that you give something just for the for the sake that it, it, it keeps re See, generosity breaks selfishness. When I learn to live generously, it breaks the grip of, of selfishness in my life. So I'd say the first thing is that this is a season for the church to love and care for you. Second thing is, if you've been blessed in this season, you know, I mean, if, if that you have really financially flourished, God's given that to you to steward. So here's your opportunity to steward it well. Increase your giving for the sake of others who can't. That's where we as Christians recognize we're going to give for people we may never have a chance to meet or get to know personally, but they're in need. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, Tommy. We had a woman at Park one time, a single mom. Man, she was in a rough spot. And so our deacons came along her side, gave to her, helped her out, got her on her feet, just really loved her and cared for her well. And then she became very successful in business. Yeah. And she came back and said, I want to give for others. And, I, you know, I want to invest in the benevolence ministry for the sake of other single moms like me. And I think now is the time that we all, if we're in a good financial position to say, all right, I'm going to up it for the sake of others who yeah. are not. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not to stereotype a lot of times principles here is, did you find that how you communicate giving to baby boomers, millennials, younger people, all that stuff was different? Approach? Yeah, very much so. You know, as we we're talking about, it, it, it was 10 years ago, vision. If you got up and were able to cast a strong vision, you know, let's take the hill, you know. Here's what I'm do. People rallied around that. And then it began to shift as millennials came of age and began to move into church. 
They just didn't resonate with that. But they did resonate with cause. And so I had to shift. I had to learn that. You know, when I realized what I was saying was falling on deaf ears, I had to go, OK, what's going on? And that's when you had to come back and say, I've got to communicate around cause. Builders, the generation above me, that they just gave out a responsibility. That's just what you did. That's my father. You know, my father became a follower of Christ in his 20s. He learned to give. He goes, that's just what you do. And then the next generation, my generation, was responsive to vision, busters, a little of this, a little of that, and the millennials, for sure, respond to cause. Yeah. So the pastor who's sitting here, Jackson, and so a lot of times, hey, our goal is to plant and to continue to build gospel-centered churches. Our vision is to continue to be a light for the community. That's my vision. How do you turn that into a cause then? How is the church going to meet the needs of the community? You know, if there was a time that we're going to do, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And just the idea of explaining that vision just lit people up and they were responsive. But now it needs to be, here's why. If if we plan a church, here's what that church is going to be able to do in the lives of people. Here's how the gospel is going to go out from the church and engage in that community. We're going to address homelessness. We're going to address fatherlessness, you know, whatever it might be. But here's what we're going to do. Here's the cause if that makes sense, that we're going to engage in. Got it, got it. You also talked a little bit about that you avoid seeing how much each person individually gives. Let's say a person sits there and challenges you, Jackson, and says, I actually want to know what each person gives. I will be able to challenge each person, especially if they have a wealth. What would you say to that person? I would say it will ruin your soul. <laughs> because the, the human nature, our brokenness, the unredeemed part in us, wants to be able to have influence and power with those that have resources. Yeah. We want to be like them because of what we can gain from them. Man, if we if we <clears throat> focus on them, if we're able to get them to like us more, they might let us use their summer home. They might let us use X, Y, and Z, right? And, and it's not healthy. It's not healthy for you. I would say it's better not to know, treat everybody the same. That doesn't mean that you're not mindful of those in your church who have resources. But you'll be surprised. Sometimes yeah. the people that have resources don't look at it. The people yeah. that, that you think have resources really don't. It's, it's, it's all a parents issue. But everybody needs to be challenged. Yeah. And, and then I, you know what I didn't say, Tommy, is there's people who have the gift of giving, and that needs to be developed like every other spiritual mm -hmm. gift. Mm -hmm. And if you learn that people have the gift of giving, you need to educate them. You need to invest in them. You know, you need to speak into their lives and help them, just like if someone has the gift of teaching. We train teachers. We need to train and invest in those who have the gift of giving. And, and those people bubble up, and you get to know them. They're the ones that keep volunteering. Hey, if you got a need, let me know, or they contribute to something or whatever. But you find out as the yeah. pastor, invest in them. And I mean, Jackson, you and I, you, Don, and I have a mutual friend. He lives in Indonesia. And when we first met him, he was working on a startup. Now he's done really financially well, but he's learned the importance of giving, but he needed someone to encourage and challenge him and help him think through that process. You know, most people that learn to invest well in the kingdom, it's because someone invested well in them in this area. Yeah. There's a couple of, at my age, everybody's younger. There's a couple of younger folks at Park that God has really convicted about living incredibly generously to live on very little and give a lot away. And so what we do, we connect them with others. You and I have a mutual friend that lives out east. Yep. And so we took one of these guys and connected him with him because yep. this guy lives yep. very generously so he, he can invest. And now we just had a, a woman, dear friend of ours that saying, I feel like God's leading me this way. And we connected her with this young guy from Park who yep. is learning how to do it. Yep. And this mutual friend that we have in the East Coast, ever since I've known him for the last 12 years, he's always challenged me, Tommy, are you a steward of God's money? Because remember, it's not yours. And so way back 10 years ago, when I first met him, he says, before you even become successful, you're struggling now as an individual, as you're building everything, make a commitment right now. What are you going to do with your finances? Because if you start making that decision when things are going well, you'll never, ever make those decisions. Uh, and I totally agree. When Don and I didn't have two nickels to rub together, I mean, when we were young youth pastors somewhere, I mean, seriously, we still chose to, 
What does it mean for us to give? What does it mean for us to steward? And so it was already a value for us as a young couple. So as we grew in, 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 in our salary increased or whatever, then it was already part of, of, of our plan. Yeah. And Jackson, a lot of times is uh, we, last yesterday, we actually interviewed two director of developments and director of communications for nonprofit ministries. In your mind, talk about the difference of the role of an executive director pre president fundraising for a ministry organization versus a pastor fundraising for their church. <laughs> okay. Uh I would say someone fundraising for a parachurch organization doesn't have the additional responsibility of shepherding. Correct. The pastor has the responsibility of shepherding, of the good and the bad. The church cannot pick who's going to be involved. God brings and we engage with whoever comes through the door or whoever that we engage with when we invite in, in the door. And, you know, and, you know, Tommy, very well, the church gets all types of people, the prickly pears, as, as well as the people who just everybody loves. And, and the responsibility of the church is to love and care for them. Where in a parachurch ministry, and I was in a parachurch ministry for several years, it, you can kind of pick and choose. And, and, and please, if you're in a parachurch ministry, I think you're yep. awesome. Yep. Great. Yep. Yep. We appreciate you. But you don't have the responsibility that a pastor has. And that you can have different types of conversations without having the other types of conversations that, that are going on. And a pastor doesn't have that choice, it, nor do we want to. We want to be holistically engaged in the lives of people. And plus, at the same time, with your role as a pastor, you literally are on the pulpit every single week communicating your heart with the people. You're sharing your voice versus I think a lot of times with the nonprofits, they don't know that person. And so a lot of times with those individuals, they don't can't get a chance to speak and allow the people to hear their heart. That's a great insight, Tommy. That's a great insight and vice versa. You know, we should know our people and our people know us. You know, a, a phrase I like and I stole it from someone else is that shepherds ought to smell like sheep. Yeah. And, and that's something that in an organization, that's not always the case. But again, I'm grateful. I want to make sure you hear this. I'm grateful for parachurch ministries. Yep. Agreed. And Two other things or a couple other things is uh, in terms of staff, more and more churches are hiring a director of stewardship, pastoral resources, whatever it is. What do you think of that role? If it's a discipleship role, if it's helping people understand holistically what it means to grow as a steward, you know, in all areas of our life, right? Our time, our time, our time, talent, and treasure is three words that I borrowed from somebody else. You know, your time, your talent, your treasure, and they're helping people understand how to use that and engage in that. I think it's great. If it's merely for the sake of to build our budget so that we can build another building or whatever, that bothers me. But if it's for the sake that we're really going to get down in the mud and help our folks understand what it means to mature in this area, then I think it's fantastic. And many times it has long been overlooked in the church. Yeah. You've also worked with consultants. At what point does a church bring in an outside consultant to help with fundraising? Yeah, and, and Park did a couple of times. In the church I was previously in, we brought in a consultant. And consultants are incredibly helpful to give you perspective. Sometimes, you know, the phrase, you can't see the forest for the trees. You, you're so involved that you need someone to pull you back and to give you some hard information and to ask hard questions. So I think if, if they come in and they're willing not to just give you, you know, the playbook, here's a playbook, do this, because this is what everybody else does. But they're willing to come in and go, I want to learn you. I want to understand you. And let's make adjustments based on who you are then I think consultants can be incredibly helpful. Uh, we had several, some were better than others, but the best ones were ones who came in and said, I wanna learn you, I wanna understand you. Now, based on what I know, here's what I'd like to suggest. And we didn't take every idea. There are some things we would not do. I would not do. I said as lead pastor, I cannot do that. Uh, before the Lord, I cannot do that. I know others did, and with the right conscience, I cannot. Yeah, yeah. And in some sense, I kind of know what the answer is, but let me just still put you on the spot is, do you believe that churches should have these big banquet fundraisers to raise money for the church? What's your stance on that? I personally, I've done them. I've been involved in them. Uh, I personally would prefer smaller settings where you can interact and people can ask questions and it, it, smaller where they can really feel like they're able to engage with you 
because people have questions and they ought to ask their questions and they ought to be able to push back and they ought to be able to hear from you and from the leadership things. And sometimes a big banquet feels, uh, a, a, again, I know a yep. lot of people yep. do it and, and it, it's fine for them. I would just say, I think I'd rather, and I know it's time, I can tell you, when, when Don and I would go through a stewardship initiative, I would say to her, I'll see you in three months. I'd rather have 10 smaller ones than one large one because of the interaction I think we can have. Yeah. It's, it's far better. And know this a lot of times for those who are watching or listening now or in the future is a lot of times we're talking with Jackson who has different experience, but you may disagree with some of those things. And at the same time, but I like the individual approach because Jackson, you would probably say each person has certain passions that the Lord has placed in his or her life. How do you continue to really communicate the need that is in line with those passions, but also address any other issues that they may have pertaining to it? Absolutely. And Tommy, with that idea of passions, let me say, sometimes your church cannot do what that person correct, wants to do. Correct, 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 do. correct. And I've had to look some people in the eye and go, listen, that's a great idea. We yes. just can't do it here or we're not going to do it. But let me tell you, the church right down the street, man, they want to do that. Go, go yep. with our blessing. Yep. Go and be a part. Because it's more important that you're engaged somewhere than that you stay yep. here. Or a lot of times there are certain passions that they want to give to. Hey, by the way, I know a lot of times you may not be interested in this campaign, but so-and-so different organizations in the city are doing this. Or have you ever checked this out? It shows that you're honoring with them and connecting to how they are wired as well, too, and listening to them and ministering to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, at the end of the day, we want to watch people grow. But I will say that I do believe the first place we need to give is to our local community, faith yep. community. I think that is very, very important. I think it's very biblical, yep. but that doesn't mean it's the only place. Yeah, Tangibly, I, I think and I say this as an Asian, a lot of times I, uh, I don't like asking and you get to run around. As a pastor, how do you make an ask in individual meetings that is appropriate, that shows and honors the individual? And I'm telling you, for some, it's easy. I have no doubt. For me, every, every conversation like this was difficult. And every conversation like this was the faith walk with me. Now, what's happened many times is you sit down to have the conversations and they beat you to it. They say, hey, listen, we want to be a part of what's going on here. You know, talk to us about it. Other times that I would have to stop and look at them and say, listen, I want to invite you to come and be a part of what God is doing here. I've shared it with you. It seems like you've been responsive to what I've shared. You've nodded your head. And so I'd like to invite you to come and be a part of this with us. What do you think about that? Talk to me. And then I want to give them an opportunity because sometimes people don't give. You know, Tommy, in a church, people vote two ways. They vote with their feet or they vote with their pocketbook. Yeah. And sometimes someone's upset with the church, they quit giving. So if I sit down with a couple and I find out they're not giving or whatever, I want to hear what happened. What did we do? What can yeah. we correct? Yeah. It, it, sometimes it's a simple apology, but that allows you in that ask to be able to deal with that discipleship issue. Again, that growth issue with them looking them in the eye. But it's hanging uncomfortable yeah. for, for many of us. The other thing I would say, make sure you do it as a couple. We offend wives when yeah. we only yep. men. We assume yeah. instead, like in our in our marriage, it, it's it's a partnership in the way that we think about our finances. Include the spouse. Yeah. Include them. Jackson, that's a very, very important. I actually talked with one individual, a female of means there. She says, every time the, a group comes and talks to me, they automatically go and schedule a meeting with my husband. What they don't realize is that you're going to insult me because I'm actually the one writing the checks every single time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, it would offend my wife in the same way. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you ever made an ask of a specific amount? Or do you recommend doing that? <sighs> That's one of the things I battle with consultants about, you know, where they'll say you should go in and ask them. And I, and I struggle with that for the simple reason that sometimes it might be an under ask. 
I think it's better if I really believe in the work of the spirit, that the spirit convicts and guides in people's lives, right? As we read about in, in John 14 and 16. If I really believe that people that are connected to the spirit live generously and will hear God's voice, then I, I really want to leave that with them. Now, you could say to me, well, Jackson, maybe you're just checking it out. OK, maybe. But I really do believe that when you leave it to them, times people are even more generous than you anticipated. Now, could they also be less generous? Do they feel like they were let off the hook? That's also possible and true. Yeah. What's a good balance? And now I'm, before I talk about sermons, I'm going to talk about communications. As a pastor, leader or something like that, you are on social media, you send out emails, all of that stuff. How much are you asking? Would you say, man, you need to kind of include elements of it in your email, your words once a month or in certain periods of time? What do you recommend where it doesn't feel like you're asking too much, but you're not asking enough times? Sometimes like in an email, a weekly email that goes out, we do pastoral emails. Most of our pastors do for their locations that it's OK to put somewhere in there just kind of an update. You know, here's where we are financially, just simple at the bottom, just where we are. FYI, there's other times to address it. There's other times tell stories of what's going on. Remember, people like being part of a winning team. Again, crafts. But people want to know their church is taking kingdom ground. So what you're doing is you're not asking for money, but you're reminding people why it's important to give when you tell stories of what's happening. Cast vision around that. So I think you've got to look. It's like painting a, a picture with various colors. You just need to decide what's the best one at this time. Mm. What about sermon? You mentioned a lot of times that you need to start early and not wait to December. Is it done in just a four week sermon series? Do you regularly say, Hey, you got to talk about it and have a series two or three times a year. How often do you preach? How often do you teach on it? We would once or twice a year, definitely talk about like our subject today is giving, you know, I get up and say, we're going to talk about money. And I realize already about two thirds of you are uncomfortable. Hang in there with me. And so it'd just be direct. Other times it would really be with stories that I would weave in about generosity, how people would choose to live. But then we would start earlier, just beginning to explain what's going on with the church. Here's what's going on. Here's where we are. Uh, you know, we're meeting budget or we're behind budget. Uh, toward the end of my time there, we would give these two minute, three minute clips of updates, you know, just how the church is doing and how each location is doing. And people really appreciate I got a lot of feedback. People appreciate it kind of knowing where we were. So you just find a number of different ways. That way, if you come toward and you're going, we're still in the hole. People have already heard it. Remember one of the things that I said just about the time, and this happened regularly, Tommy, just about the time I was sick of saying it, someone would go, oh, really? We're having trouble as a church or we're behind or, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, my goodness gracious. Where have you been? But you have to say it and you have to say it a number of different ways in order to get it. And so there needs to be a plan. There needs to be a communication plan put together to help your church come to this place of finances. But it's also important to understand it's not just finance, it's serving. It's a number of ways, you know, to put the whole package together of stewardship. Yeah, uh, which actually speaks to a communications plan. If a particular church, medium sized, they don't have a full staff, like maybe you guys once did, do you recommend that they hire part-time people like to work on finance, work on communications, or is it better to really be able to have volunteers? Is it that important that you need to hire up, even if it's a part-time person, do all these things? I think financially having someone that you're paying that you can really hold accountable because it's that important in today's world. You and Tommy, you and I have heard many yeah. churches blown up because somebody ran off with money or, or didn't handle it well, even in their innocence, they didn't handle it well. And it's, it's not a good thing. Hiring someone, even part-time, even, uh, you know, there's businesses now that will come in and do your payroll and things like that for you. You know, hiring somebody that you know that is going to do a professional job. And I'd say communication. Communication, you could probably get by with some volunteers because there's so many people now that are so good at the social media and other things that would, frankly, that would be their gift to the church. There's been times as a pastor where people have said to me, I'm not in a place financially where I can give where I want to, but I can give time. And I go, fantastic. That's great. Why don't you do this for us? And so there may be some young 
folks, uh, millennials in the church, young folks, I'm like 90 years old, some younger folks in the church that are excellent in this area where this could be their service. You know, this yeah. could be their act of, of stewardship with their time and their talent. COVID-19 has changed a lot of different things. As you sit here right now, looking from the outside in, no longer living in Chicago, do you see the days of churches investing, investing in buildings changing? Tommy, pre, pre-COVID, I, I, be, I believe for the last couple of years, I, I think the mega church will always be with us. I don't think the mega church is going to go away. I think there will always be mega churches here in America and around the world. But I think the majority of churches, one of the things I read was 80% of the churches in America are 200 or less. People want to be in smaller communities. They want to be in a place where they know and they can be known. And so I think buildings help shape that, smaller buildings. And so I look back. Now, this is me talking. This is me. This is not the elders at Park. So this is me. Uh, you know, frankly, where we are now uh, in culture, even pre-COVID, I think the building that we had at Near North was too large. I think it, we, we could have, if we knew what we knew now, we would have done a smaller building and found other things that we could do. So I, I would say smaller buildings are going to really be as we come out of COVID. The second thing I think is that you're going to see more home churches because that's how people are connecting. And we're going to find out they really love it this way. They love a group of 15 or 20, frankly, like the early church. Tommy Barnard just came out and said a couple of things that were interesting. One out of three churches will close because of COVID. No, one out of five churches will close because of COVID. And one out of three regular attenders before COVID will stop going to church altogether. Yeah. So church is going to change. And so now is the time. Frankly, we have this period of COVID to kind of reshape what the church yeah. looks like, how it should look like, how we can get smaller and how we can be more nimble. And this, if I can say this, COVID has been a gift to the church. Now, the question is, will we make enough adjustments that we just don't go back to normal when it's over? Correct, 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 correct. It, as a lead pastor, you look at your budget and you're dealing with cash flow, right? And eventually we're actually going to do a session on cash flow and everything like that. And But the Lord has placed on your heart to really increase the budget. But you're sitting there, man, it's going to give a type. I feel like so strongly that I'm being led to. How do you balance those two? You know, how do you stretch your people faithfully, biblically, gospelly, versus what's just feeding your ego? So you really have to. That's why I believe in the plurality of elders. You go to the elders. You, you share this. You guys pray. You fast together. And then you really ask the question, God, are, are we hearing from Jackson? Are we hearing from your spirit? Is there unity around this idea? And I, and I believe that firmly that the, that the spirit will speak to the, to the leaders of the church. And there have been times that our leaders were great when they just said to, said to me, because I, I am a vision cause person, man. Let's make it happen. Let's go. Let's drive this baby. And they would be very good to go. You know, I don't think so, or at least not now. And so I, I believe in the plurality of elders and I would stop. OK. All right. That was me. I was listening to me. I called it the spirit, but it was me. And other times there would be unity and say, absolutely, this is it. You're right. And then they would add some things and we would tweak it and would come out in a much better place than what I brought in. So I think you have to really go to other people and say, talk with me about this. Yeah. Too many times that we think we're Moses and we've gone to the Mount Sinai and come down with the Ten Commandments. And I just I don't think in the church, in the New Testament church, I don't think that's the best, healthiest way. I think it really is the plurality of elders with people functioning in their gifting. If you know, if, if you have the gift of leadership, allowing that gift to come out, but with wisdom and discernment yeah. around you. Let's spend the last section on power and money. We've seen in the news today different ministry leaders have fallen because of the issue of power and money. As your church gets bigger, your budget gets bigger, and suddenly you get invited to speak in the private planes, the large honorariums. You surround yourself with staff who are afraid to challenge you. You know, no one says no to you anymore. And so, and then those staff really enjoy the perks of the private planes and all that stuff. How do you protect yourself? It, one, it's sad, isn't it? We just read about one last week, didn't he? Didn't we? Another guy. And 
it's just it's heartbreaking because it's credibility for all of us we all get tainted don't we we all get painted with the brush and not one of us is without sin you know we all have our dark side every one of us without the work of the spirit in our lives i would say what's important is accountability you know one of the things i love about my wife she loves me she supports me she encourages me but she's not she hadn't read my press clippings you know if i throw my boxers on the floor i still need to pick them up she's not my maid she's my spouse you know she's my partner and so that's important and then to have people around you i've said to the elders a number of times at park i don't want to go to a church where the lead pastor gets his way it's not healthy for the church now, is it frustrating at times when, when I believe I've come down Mount Sinai and I captured God's will for us as a church? Yeah, I would love to be able to get my way. But I've learned enough over the years, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for anybody. So will people say no to you? And will people redirect you? Because when you don't hear no, you begin, you know, they talk about absolute power absolutely corrupts. And in our fallen nature, it just appeals to us, our ability to, to be known and to be recognized yeah. and to be egos to be fed. So are there people in your life who will look you in the eye and just tell you the truth? I had an elder at Park. And in fact, we're, we, we're still friends and, and still keep up with each other, even though we moved halfway around the world. And the thing I loved about it, he would tell me the truth. He'd look me in the eye and just tell me the truth. He would disagree with me. No, no, Jackson, I don't think so. And I got to tell you, the first couple of times, it, it caught me off guard. But then I found myself gravitating toward him because I hungered for someone to be honest with me. Yeah. I mean, there were other people, but this elder in particular, I just loved him for that. Yeah. Let me push you a little bit like that. In some sense, what goes on internally inside the life of a leader is a lot of times all of the people who we've read about who have struggled or fallen or accused of certain things, they've all had elders around them. They've all, they all said they've had accountability. They all have things in place, and yet they still manage to buck the system. What has to be going internally inside of you to make sure that all of these things that are set around you to protect you from this is working? You believe you're above the law. You believe that you have a right to some of these things. And frankly, Tommy, a lot of it is stress. There is such stress. It's, I don't think it's ever been harder than now to be a pastor. I'll be honest with you, man. It, it, I think it's incredible. I tell the young pastors at Park, it's, there's never been a harder season to be a pastor. What we do is we begin to lie to ourselves. We begin to create a story that I need, that I deserve, that I should have. And then we lie to those around us. You know, accountability is only as good as the truth and what we're willing to share. And that's why in, in accountability relationships that I've been in, and I got this from somebody else, the last question I, and I always say, will you please ask me this question? Have you been truthful in all your answers? Because it's one last check. It's one last check. But you'll find that people who say I have accountability, that somewhere they began to lie. They began to run through one stop sign, and then they found it easy to run through the next one, then to run through the next one, because they began to spin a narrative about themselves that they're bigger than this, yep. and they're, they're above the law, so to speak. A phrase is I've read some of these stories that I've heard from different people who said, God has rewarded me because I've been working so hard and I've been rewarded by God. And that's why these things happen. And I just fell into it. Jackson, for those who are listening to this, what would you say to that that's those a, particular issues? I would say that's a lie. It's a lie. You know, that when we begin to think we're reward, what we're saying is, I, I think I deserve to be rewarded. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that God's kindness, sometimes things are given or things are extended towards you because people that know you recognize it'd be helpful if you were to use their summer home or their yacht or I don't know, whatever, those kind of things. Sometimes, you know, it's just the kindness of God that he rewards you that way. But when we begin to say to ourselves, because I deserve this, I've done X, Y, and Z, therefore, it's, it's a moralistic gospel. You know, that's the idea that I have earned my salvation, that I have earned my right. You know, God owes me. And Tommy, that's dangerous. And it's not that every follower of Christ has wrestled with that from time to time. I wrestle with that from time to time. But the gospel says you deserve nothing, not a thing. 
And it's the kindness of God that has extended anything to you. And so I think there's that thin line that we have to be mindful of. Yeah. Last question for you is, I mean, as you are now uh, have gone from Chicago and toward your end over at Park from when you first started as a pastor way back in Pennsylvania, how has the role of that pastor changed over those 20 some 30 something years? Okay, my role as a pastor? No, in general, I, or even as you reflect in terms of when you were pastoring, how did that change over the last 30 years? Yeah, I would say one of the things is that the pastor was respected at one time. You know, you could trust the word of the pastor. And then little by little, that began to be torn down. You know, by various it. pastors, we found that we're not trustworthy. And again, we all get tainted and painted with that. There was a time when the pastor was one of the smartest people, especially in some of you know towns or villages or whatever. The pastor was one of the most educated and his his knowledge was sought out. He was included in decisions. And then that slowly moved away. You know, the church in the center of town and kind of represented we need that truth. And then that got slowly pushed away. And that could probably even go back to 40 years. And then just to respect the people in, in, in the seats. Uh, people became cynical and skeptical and people began to say, I don't know if I trust you anymore. I don't know if you're trustworthy, even though maybe nothing has happened. But again, we get tainted and the trustworthiness of who we are gets challenged. Uh, there's just you can a number of those kind of things. I, I saw a poll a couple of years ago where they talked about the trustworthiness of various uh, occupations. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> was way down the line, you know, next to used car salesman almost, yep. you know, it was way down the line. And so some, we've lost some of that. No, that's good. Hey, as we wrap up, as time is, uh, and the year comes, what's your encouragement for those who are listening here today? I, I would say, you know what, this, these are incredibly exciting times. Honestly, we have a chance to reinvent the church, to come out of this much stronger the church has always done its best in the hardest situations. You can go anywhere in time and history. We have always flourished the best in the hardest of, of situations. And so we need to ask ourselves, okay, not just how do we exist, but how do we flourish as a church? How do we really get after this and say, okay, let's use this. God's got a plan. This is Obviously, this didn't catch God off guard. And so he has a plan for the church. God, what is your plan for the big C church? And let's engage with it. You know, Tommy, I read an article the other day about Newton, you know, the guy that, that described gravity for us, the, the laws of gravity. You know, when he described the laws of gravity and figured out calculus and a couple other things, it was during the plagues in, in England in the 1600s. He was sent home from school. He was sent home, I believe it was from Cambridge. He was sent home from Cambridge. And while he was home is where he figured out some of these things. And so the question is, what are we doing through, in, through the COVID? You know, what are we going to do for the sake of investing and building the kingdom? It's a great time. Let's figure this out. Yeah, thank you. Hey, I'm sorry. I probably can't end this without asking you one final question, Jackson, because a lot of times I actually didn't hear this from you. you uh, after the election, you would have had to address the entire church. We didn't get a chance to hear you. A lot of times on both sides, they're just frustrated, either one or the other side. What would you have said to the congregation after the election? Uh, 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 just broadly, right? Yeah, I just broadly, give broadly. Broad principle. God is still God. You know, all this stuff falls under his sovereign control. One, two, please, let's not make politics our religion. You know, our, our religion, so to speak, our faith is based on Christ. That's who we worship. Three is that we've got to learn to be able to engage with those who disagree. Never before, like we see it in America, I believe, never, at least in my lifetime, have we seen people split over political issues like they are now. It, it's unbelievable. We lost our ability to graciously, in, graciously engage. So as followers of Christ, we need to respond to each other as the gospel has responded to us. Be gracious, be kind, be accepting. Can we disagree? Absolutely. Can we verbalize it? Absolutely. But let's make sure that we are Christians before we're Democrats or Republicans. And then regardless of the president, we have a responsibility to pray for him. And so let's pray for him. Let's pray that he leads wisely, regardless of who sits in that office. We need to be praying that. 
But that's what I would broadly say, Tommy. Got it. Jackson, thank you so much. Hey, by the way, uh, it's evening time, and I know you have to go to bed soon, so I just want to say thank you for just staying up and doing this with us. Uh, man, you're welcome. I always enjoy being with you, Tommy. You know you're one of my favorite people, so thank you for inviting me. We'll talk to you. Say hi to Donna. And for more information, go to www.thegrowcenter.org or ashley.com. So, Jackson, thank you so much, and we'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye.